education has to be there to challenge you, period. It has to challenge you. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to accept, of course, every single thing that a professor or a teacher says in the classroom. Matter of fact, I tell them as much uh, around the first week. I tell them, you don't have to accept everything I'm saying. But my job here is to, to make you think <clears throat> in its purest form. Just think about things. Um, I, I'll betray my own bias here. I think that the whole idea that education is supposed to make you comfortable makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I think that the, the absolute major purpose of education is to rock your world. You know, it's to take you where you came from and take you to other places that you have to consider. Comedy is that way, too. Um, anything from the past is that way. It becomes fraught with things, values that are those of the past, not today. We need to we need to understand those. We don't have to say, gee, those were swell. But we have to understand them if we want to understand that particular part of history. Welcome to The Neutral Ground. It's often said that laughter is the best medicine. But medicine for what? I would argue that right now it's our best chance at healing the divides and antagonistic feelings that I think we all sense are routinely circulating in our collective and personal environments these days. When comedy is at its best, it exposes the concerns, anxieties, and difficulties of the time period and challenges us to see just how easy it is to forget that we actually share a lot in common as a species. Although we like to think of comedy as being universal, transcending generations and time periods, and some of the great stuff actually does do this, I would argue that this is not usually the case. In order for comedy to work, you must take risks, not risks in the past, but in the present. Such was the case for the comedians we're going to be discussing today, the Marx Brothers. And our guest, Dr. Robert Weir, has done a fantastic job of capturing the historical framework in which these wonderful comedians lived and worked. Dr. Weir is a retired history professor who most recently taught at the University of Massachusetts Amherst a former senior Fulbright scholar to New Zealand, and a past president of the Northeast Popular Culture Association. Additionally, he's authored 11 books and numerous other academic works. Pretty impressive. In this episode, we're going to be using his book, The Marx Brothers and America, to enter into a world of comedic genius. We'll talk about their upbringing, the difficulties they faced entering Hollywood, the leading ladies of the Marx Brothers, and a lot more. If you want to support our efforts to bring civility back to the mainstream, hit the subscribe slash follow button, leave a kind comment or rating where applicable, and share the show with a friend. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Robert Weir. Rob, welcome to The Neutral Ground. I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite a while now. When we were younger, my parents would actually uh, often expose me and my two sisters to movies and shows from previous generations. And one of the movies that I loved as a kid and still love today is Horse Feathers, starring the Marx Brothers. So when I came across your book, The Marx Brothers and America, I knew that I had to have you on the show. So I'd like to actually begin this conversation by asking you to discuss a little bit of your own journey with the Marx Brothers. When were you first exposed to the Marx Brothers, and what was that initial experience like? Uh, like you, it was when I was quite young. Uh, and as I describe in the book, I grew up in a town uh, in South Central Pennsylvania that was, quote, tough by early 60s standards, which means that a lot of people wanted to beat you up. They usually didn't have knives or guns or anything like that. Um, but because I grew up um, on the edge of a Black neighborhood, there was this uh, custom that was called playing the nines, which is an insult game. Yeah, those who aren't familiar with it, it's like, your mama's so fat, that kind of thing. Uh, but the rule of the insult game was, if somebody was threatening you physically, and you could beat them with your mouth, they weren't allowed to beat you up. It would be a badge of dishonor. So I discovered the Marx Brothers. My father, by the way, uh, was always watching old movies 
Um, but he wasn't so keen on the Marx Brothers, but I, I saw the Marx Brothers and went, whoa, <laughs> Groucho's insults, I can use those. Uh, I didn't actually even know exactly what some of them meant as a little kid, but um, that kind of uh, mentality in my hometown kind of stretched into the junior high years when it did matter a lot more than it mattered as a kid. You just because, you know, kids pummel each other and you get a bloody nose and you go home and cry. And junior high school gets a little bit more <laughs> serious. And so I really started to watch the Marx Brothers again uh in junior high school. And then by the time I got to high school, I had some friends who were also Marx Brothers fans, and they tended to come on at midnight, which was just absolutely great if you're a bunch of teenagers, right? <laughs> uh, and we would watch all those movies again and again and again. Uh, and then, you know, as you start getting a little bit older and you start thinking about other things going on in your society, then you start to think about the things that are uh, more profound, that are uh, lurking within the films. So I, I, I went from there. Um, and then I had an adult journey, but I guess we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, how did this, that's a great primer for this question as well. How did this evolve from entertainment to you to kind of a cultural interest? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, one of the things you find out when you teach is that you need to find hooks to get your students interested in things. And that's something I think that um, I don't want to uh, paint with too broad of a brush here, but I think that's something that a lot of deans uh, don't appreciate. You know, they want their, their, their faculty to, to be weighty as that, as it were. But, you know, when you're dealing with a room full of undergraduates, you, you look around for things to, to uh, help you get an entree into talking what, what you're taught, what you want them to really learn. And I found that if I, I, pirated things from popular cultures. It's, a, it's an old educational theory of course. You start with what they know and move them to what they don't know. Uh, but then I actually uh, evolved a couple of courses on comedy and American history. Uh, and the Marx Brothers were central to that. So I started collecting material for this book <laughs> probably a decade and a half, maybe two decades before I actually wrote it. Uh, had things in the drawer, you know, things that worked, things that didn't work, um, and books on my shelf and articles that were um, in file cabinets and that kind of thing. Um, so that became really the the kind of adult interest, uh, the the kind of professorial interest, is to to find those things in popular culture that could um, basically, you know, I hope there are no students walk, watching, but trick them into, <laughs> into learning. Uh, my field. Now, I'm, I'm an American historian. I'm not a cultural um, historian, a, a, a cultural uh, studies person, or an English person. I'm an American historian. Um, and that's the, the whole purpose of the book, is to uh, think about uh, what you can learn about American history. Based on the fact that the number one thing you have to do at any point in, in history is you, if you don't know what's going on in the zeitgeist, you probably aren't going to get the joke. So it became a way of saying, well, let's see if we can go into the time machine here and go back and find out what people's attitudes were and what these cultural references are and, and so forth and so on. Uh, you know, I, I, as I, I think I also describe in the book, um, well, I did describe it in the book, actually. Uh, you, you know, one of the first things I started with, with I decided to show a little clip from the Marx Brothers, and I'd say, is this funny? And, you know, you, students would be looking around wide-eyed, like, what am I supposed to tell this guy? And finally, you know, if it works well, one brave student will say, I don't get it. And I'll say, good for you. That's exactly the point. And from there, we would start talking about how you have to unpack history from the back to the front, right? So you have to know what's going on at that period of time. And then I would start showing the films and, and we would we would have little exercises talking about, okay, who's this person? What's this person? Before I even showed the film. And it made, of course, all the difference in the world. Because they could mm -hmm. see what the jokes were. Uh, they didn't always like the jokes. There's no reason why they should, you know, because it's not their world. Uh, but as an exercise in learning history, it worked pretty well. So 
the more that the students kind of began to understand the the cultural surroundings of the the jokes, did they did it open them up more to feeling comfortable laughing at it and starting to really get get it? Like did did it catch on with them the Marx Brothers comedy? Yeah, uh, uh, to a point. You know, if you if you show all thirteen films, then you find that that there's a lot of repetition. There's shtick. Uh, that appears in in every film, and so you uh, you kind I kind of at least went heavier at, at the beginning, and then started showing uh, clips, selected clips towards the end uh, that were targeted at certain things that I wanted them to learn. But um, yeah, it, it's certainly certainly the case. You know, that actually, when you start out, the students immediately line up behind. Oh, I really like this person. I don't get this person. Inevitably. Uh, Except I had one student who, who, for reasons that are mysterious to me, was in love with Zeppo. <laughs> um, uh, everybody's favorite at first is is Harpo, because he's a, he's a universal clown. You know, he doesn't speak, so all his shtick is physical, and you don't need to unpack that as much. And then after a while, then you start to to move into. Um, you know, what are they saying, and what are the issues that are actually being spoken? Uh, about immigration or inferred about immigration and so forth, and go from there. And Groucho is usually the last person that they get, they the undergraduates get because his rapid fire delivery. He he just never stops. He's like a guy, you know, who, who drinks three pots of coffee, <laughs> uh, and you know, then they start to eventually. You know, I would actually so, sometimes slow down stuff and say, okay, what's that line? And uh, they would go from that, but um, yeah, he's usually the last one that they they get. So it kind of goes Harpo Chico because he's he's kind of a a, a clown as too uh, as well, a very savvy clown despite the fact that he appears to be stupid. Uh, and then Groucho, uh, and Groucho of course is also the most aggressive of of the Marx Brothers. So um, you know people who are a little. Uh, I don't know what's the right word. A little bit, I guess, scared of aggressive humor, or or think it's just mean spirited. Um, you know, it takes them a while to get past that and say, well, no, it's you know, he's playing a character. Everybody in a movie is playing a character. So what is this character trying to communicate to us? And you know, why does he say such awful things to Mar to Margaret Dumont? You know, and the answer to that is always because, okay, what time period are we in? And it's 1930s and it's the Great Depression and she's an upper class snob. <laughs> and that is absolute, that's absolutely red meat to a, a guy like, like, uh, like Groucho. And so, you know, those insults fly because that is what resonated in that era. Yeah. Yeah, we're absolutely going to be talking about uh, Margaret Dumont in a, in, a, in a little bit because um, I I love her. <clears throat> Every scene that she's in, I absolutely think is brilliant. I'm not surprised that Harpo is kind of the one that the the students kind of enjoy right from the beginning because of again that physical comedy as you mentioned. And I could see, although I hadn't thought about it, I could see where students might be hesitant to laugh publicly in a classroom at Groucho right away until they get kind of a feel for the room to say, okay, is it okay for us to be laughing at this? You know, someone's got to kind of break that ice and be the first one to say, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> I'm just going to laugh. Yeah. I, th I think that's well said. I think the, the uh, additional part of this is um, it is mean spirited. And then I have to remind them, uh, well, I always remind people, and I remind people about this today, including my adult friends, humor is mean. There is always a but to humor, right? Even if it's if you're telling a joke on yourself, you are the fool in that joke, right? Uh, and a lot of people are, are hesitant to to um to go that path, they say, well, it's just so mean, that's so mean. And I say, well, you know, man, where would we be if we didn't have humor? <laughs> oh, yeah. I want to live in that world. But No, me neither. I agree completely. But some of it is distressing by today's values. 
And as a historian, I have to tell them, we are not talking about today's values. We're talking about the values when the, the, the film was made. And yes, your question now is to take, you know, the other thing I think that is difficult for undergraduates sometimes to realize is you don't have to condone something in order to learn from it. You know, it, it's, uh, uh, I, I'll betray my own bias here. I think that the whole idea that education is supposed to make you comfortable makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I think that the, the absolute major purpose of education is to rock your world. Yeah, you know, it's just to take you where you came from and take you to other places that you have to consider. Comedy is that way too. Um, anything from the past is that way. It becomes fraught with things, values that are those of the past, not today. And we need to we need to understand those. We don't have to say, gee, those were swell, but we have to understand them if we want to understand that particular part of history. And if you don't, you're just making it up. <laughs> it's, that, it's that simple. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just to add to that. I agree completely. Education has to be there to challenge you, period. It has to challenge you. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to accept, of course, every single thing that a professor or a teacher says in the classroom. Matter of fact, I tell them as much uh, around the first week. I tell them, you don't have to accept everything I'm saying. But my job here is to, to make you think <clears throat> in its purest form. Just think about things. And then if I do my job well, I don't have to get you to try to think the way that I think. That doesn't help the world. The world is helped if I can just get you to slow down enough, because today information moves so quickly. If I can get you to slow down just enough to think a little bit about something, I trust you're going to make the best decision that you can with what information you have, period. And that's plenty for me. Yeah. Plus, we, you know, the whole idea of being a, a teacher at any level, and I taught high school uh, before I was a college professor, is that, you know, you you throw out seeds and you don't know what's going to grow. <laughs> you know, I, I can't tell you the number of students who told me that at one point they they disagreed violently with something I said, and I said, well, good for you, and you know, please do. Uh, but then they, they said, you know, later, I, years later, I thought of thought about it, and I said, thought that, hmm, maybe I need to reevaluate. Well, you know, luckily that individual told me, I can't, I have no idea how many of the students I've probably had three, three to 3,500 students in my career, something like that. Uh, who knows what all of them thought, uh, but uh, it's gratifying when some of them come back and tell you that, you know, that little thing that you said to me uh, X number of years ago, that finally came to roost. Uh, that's a good, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Of course, the other thing, because I do so much with humor, sometimes students will tell me, yeah, I remember that stupid thing you told me. <laughs> I said, well, do you remember what was attached to it? Um, no. <laughs> I love when the students remind me of something I, I said. And in the moment, I think to myself, oh, that was stupid. Why did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, those uh, students are wonderful that way, quite honestly. They, they keep you alive in a lot of ways in that sense, you know, to always, they keep us thinking, which is great and reevaluating, which is awesome. I, I'd like to, you, you do, you put in so much work into this book in terms of um, uncovering some some of the history as well, which is your area. And so I'd like to take the conversation a little bit that way, if we can. Something that really caught my attention in, in your book is the discussion of the Marx Brothers' mother, Minnie Schoenberg, also known as Minnie Palmer. Can you talk a little bit about the upbringing of the Marx Brothers and particularly how their mother impacted their introduction into show business? Well, you know, you, if you've ever heard the term show business mother, Minnie was that. I mean, she came from a, from a Russian Jewish background um, where the borders of Russia were in those days were quite different than they are today and so forth. But uh, being Jewish, they were subject to uh, she and Sam grew up, uh, um, her husband who grew up in the Alsace region of uh, what was then France and later became Germany. They were subject to pogroms. So it was there was a lot of incentive to to emigrate, uh, which they did. Um, but uh, they went to New York City and they uh, 
when the Marx Brothers, most of the Marx Brothers were born in New York City. I think they were all born in New York City, actually. Uh, they were poor. Uh, they joked about, about their, the, the father, Sam, uh, that he was apparently the world's worst tailor. He didn't bother to measure anything. <laughs> that, uh, now, you, you, everything that, that the Marx Brothers say about their childhood hit, or anything else has to be taken with a grain of salt because they curated their past over and over and over. <laughs> and so you find that the, the same stories over and over, but there's no doubt that they were that they were poor. And if you were a poor kid, I mean, none of them had, had much education at all. Uh, you know, uh, second, third grade educations we're talking about. So this is a time period in which vaudeville is uh, the ticket out of that kind of world. It's, it's it's analogous to the way that, you know, a poor kid today might think about growing up to play professional basketball. You know, if you don't have a lot of, a lot of social skills, if you didn't have a lot of money, if you didn't have a lot of formal education and so forth, but you're good with hoops, that might be a trip out. And this was the same for a lot of kids, particularly ethnic kids from ethnic backgrounds, because vaudeville was pretty, it was the place where there was maybe the most uh, social acceptance <laughs> in America. Uh, if you had a good act, they didn't care what you were. Uh, so Minnie saw that. She was ambitious herself, though she apparently was appalling as a, as a stage actress and singer. Uh, but uh, And so she started to, to groom the kids, and they didn't really have a lot of say in it. I mean, Minnie ruled the roost. You know, she, uh, it, you know, uh, when um, when Gummo decides to quit, quit the act, uh, he's the Marx Brothers you don't hear about, uh, one of the two you don't hear about. Uh, she just told Zeppo, you're going to take his place. Well, she didn't ask him. <laughs> She's told him. Uh, and so that was the kind of family uh, that that they grew up in. And, and uh, he got involved in vaudeville earlier, quite early, I think. Um, Groucho was 14 when he when he was the headline of the act. Uh, and so this is what these kids knew was was vaudeville. Um, it's probably a good thing uh, in, in retrospect, although uh, it would have been nice if many had allowed them to get a little bit more education. Groucho was always self-confident, uh, um, not self-confident, but he always lacked confidence about his lack of education um, and so forth. But uh, yeah, you know, that's a, that's the world. It's a it's a a New York City Jewish world, uh, but tempered by vaudeville and vaudeville uh, kind of kind of um, mediated a lot of the the kind of social differences between people. Interesting. So <clears throat> it's so she she sounds to me like yeah, what you would kind of think of as a typical showbiz mother, as you said able to kind of coordinate everything together. Let's fast forward a little bit here to a, a quite a difficult time, 1929. And really coming out is their, their first film, Coconuts. And for, for people in the audience who may be a, a little bit younger or don't have as much of a history understanding this time period, we take for granted certainly today this idea of hearing voices in, in films, but it, back in 1929, this is still a fairly new kind of thing here, right? And so can you walk us through a little bit of this connection between the emerging technologies in cinema and the beginning of the Marx Brothers film career? Yeah, I'd like to make, I'd like to make an, an analogy to the, uh, the film industry that's sort of like the early days of the computer industry, which is that things happen really, really fast. Now, the silent era, was an era, obviously, in which you had to depend on dramatic gestures like that to, to make your point. But but um, when sound came in, it didn't come in like in any kind of sophisticated way. The Marx Brothers were really contemplated getting out of film after the coconuts because it was so crude and because the stage experience, and, and the Coconuts was a stage show before it was a movie. Uh, it actually was a stage show during the Roaring Twenties and then came out as the Depression was, was hitting. Um, but they thought that, that the, the technology of the theater, the experience of the theater, the ability to see the dances, the ability to hear people was far superior 
uh, than in the movies. And they were absolutely right. Um, I talk about in the book how uh, there's a wonderful scene in in the coconuts where uh, Groucho is trying to put together a uh, a huckster uh, kind of development in Florida, and he takes out the map. It's like, is this map going to fall apart before our eyes? Because it's obviously sopping wet, and the reason it's sopping wet is because you wouldn't have heard any of the dialogue otherwise. You would have heard the crackling of the paper. That is the sound that the camera would have picked up. A year later, they figured that out. Right? They figure out how to how to avoid a lot of that background noise. Now they still had the cameraman up in a, a sealed booth where you would have to stop filming from time to time, lest the poor guy pass out. But you know, bam, bam, bam. In a couple of years, they're working all of these things out. So the technology is changing all the time. Uh, again, analogous to the early days of computers, where uh, I, I, when I was teaching high school, I remember that my uh, uh, I had to be the kids were looking for a, a faculty advisor to use so they could go in to use the the one computer we had, which was an old Radio Shack computer, and they pulled out a, a floppy disk. And they stuck it into the drive and waited for 20 minutes so that it could play Pong. 20 minutes, right? Well, how long did that last? <laughs> a New York minute, right? Uh, and of course, we think now uh, of what we have. And it's, uh, you know, a lot of young people today don't remember those moments. And <laughs> lucky them. Right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, and the movie industry was a bit like that, too. Now, of course, the other factor of this is it is that, uh, and this was fortuitous for the Marx Brothers as well, is you had to have people who were used to performing in a sound milieu, even though Harpo was always the mute. But a lot of uh, these early film stars apparently had horrible voices. Uh, and you can still see it in some of the early Marx Brothers films. Also, they emote as though they're speaking to the back row, <laughs> very histrionically. Um, so it takes a while for all this to, to as we say in New England, sugar off. Um, but uh, it happens fast. The technology changes so fast. And by the by the time, you know, oh, the other thing you'll see in the coconuts is you'll see a dance sequence where all you see are blurry legs. They didn't have enough cameras to catch it, to catch the dance. Uh, and maybe somebody tipped the camera, who knows? But, uh, you know, by, the, by 1932, 33, 34, um, in the middle of the Depression, they're working out this technology in amazing ways. A lot of, by the way, amazing things happen in the middle of the Depression. We built the Empire State Building in the middle of the Depression. Right. Um, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal built a lot of the infrastructure we still use during the Depression. So, uh, yeah, it was a creative period. As difficult as it was for them making this film, it must have been also difficult for them to have to deal with some of the feedback that they received. And you include actually something here that I'd like to read from the Catholic Telegraph. And then I'll admit <clears throat> that by the time I finished reading this, I actually started laughing because I could hear uh, in my head uh, kind of a, a Groucho reaction. So here's what the Catholic Telegraph had to say about the coconuts. The music is sensuous. The embracing of partners, the female only half-dressed, is absolutely indecent. And the motions, they are as such as may not be described with any respect for propriety in a family newspaper. Suffice it to say that there are certain houses appropriate for such dances, but those houses have been closed by law. And my mind immediately is hearing Groucho saying, well, point me to those houses. <laughs> you know, just kind of like, yes, you know. So my question for you, were these concerns that were brought up by the Catholic Telegraph, were these legitimately voiced opinions at the time, or was it more what needed to be said on a, on a public record? Oh, I think both of those, but, but let's not underestimate the fact that that was the, the driving uh, 
goal of the Catholic Church was to clean up um, indecency and immorality. That's kind of a holdover, by the way, from the Victorian era. That was so one of the great reform movements of the of the late 19th century to, was to try to clean up indecency and so forth. But yeah, there was the Catholic League of Decency. And that mattered. You know, you had to figure out ways to deal with that to some extent or another. They were the ones who were partially or largely responsible for writing the Hollywood Code uh, that uh, supposedly was to, to purge movies of immorality. Well, it was sort of like those houses, of, those indecent houses. You never purged them. Right? Uh, they just figure workarounds. Uh, a lot of, uh, this is not the Marx Brothers per se, but but um, W.C. Fields have invented the world word drat because you couldn't say damn, right? Uh, and so you, you figure out these, these workarounds, but you needed to be clever about it because if the Catholic League of Decency didn't approve of your film, they could put pressure on the so-called censoring boards of Hollywood that meant that they couldn't get a release of the film or a distribution in any kind of, of respectable uh, venue. And that's, of course, runs into big money. Um, yeah, the things, so you had to to be really savvy about about those things, and this is particularly true, by the way, if the Catholic League of Decency doesn't give its seal of approval in places like New York and Pennsylvania, which are the the large states. You know, that's where you're going to sell a lot of tickets in those days. So you you work it out somehow. Or I think Groucho worked it out often through that machine gun patter that I said, because you, you could watch a Marx Brothers, the same Marx Brothers film three or four times and not catch everything he says, unless you are stopping it. And you can be assured that when Hollywood is making hundreds of films a year, right, these censors, the Breen Committee and others, are not going to catch every word. And so, you know, or, you know, Groucho will say something which is on, on the page. Sometimes they do it by script, by the way. They look at scripts rather than the, than the, the uh, film itself. On the page, it looks decent enough until Groucho arches an eyebrow. And then you say, oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, there's a line in, in a wonderful line uh, in, um, in Duck Soup. Where he says about Margaret Dumont, I'd fight to defend this woman's honor, which is more than she ever did. <laughs> and, you know, uh, so, yeah, it's it's a real thing. It's a real thing. Catholic, uh, you know, we didn't actually get rid of. Um, I'm trying to remember when the code finally went went out of um, out of use. I think it was sixty two, sixty three, somewhere around there. So even up to that point, you had to really make sure you you dot the i's and cross the t's uh yeah so something that i actually really enjoyed about your book is you're quite thoughtful and methodic about how you discuss the relationship between the marx brothers religion and their jewish cultural heritage in the mid 1920s these men were on the cusp of becoming stars essentially and yet they were not without their difficulties because of anti-semitism so how did the Marx Brothers view religion, their heritage, and how did the anti-Semitism, especially in this early time period in their career, how did it impact their careers? Yeah, well, first of all, the Marx Brothers were just about as secular Jewish as you can get. Uh, they tended not to, to dwell on it other than as little side jokes, and they made fun of everything, so therefore uh, that wouldn't upset too many people, but um, they basically did it by playing characters that could be, you could relate to in any form. So Groucho is a wisecracker, right? Uh, Chico was an Italian, <laughs> apparently so good at it that some people thought he was Italian. And Harpo is, he's a mime, right? He's a, <laughs> he's silent. So what does that mean? Now, what it means uh, um, to them is, is kind of, interesting they tended to be only jewish 
if there was some kind of absolutely gross anti-Semitism thrown in their face, like being you know, not being able to be in a hotel or something, uh, you know, or uh, I guess Harpo once pretended to be a Scotsman <laughs> trying to stay in a hotel, uh, if you believe that story. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, Groucho was really bothered by the, the murder of Jewish athletes in, at the Munich Olympics. Uh, they were bothered by anti-Semitism, obviously, when uh, Harpo took his trip to uh, Russia. Uh, he had to go through Germany. He saw what was going on uh, long before Hitler came to his full horrors and long before even Kristallnacht, no, no, not long before Kristallnacht, but before Kristallnacht and so forth. So they were aware of that. Um, they've had, most of their friends were not Jewish and some of them would make jokes about it. And, and you know, that was just what they did. Uh, you know, today that would, you know, <laughs> I mean, most of my friends, I think, are Jewish, too. <laughs> uh, you know, the other day I had lunch with seven guys. I was the only non-Jewish guy there. And that, so they were cracking on me. And, and you know, and, but you can do that privately with people that you know, but you don't go into a group of people today uh, unless you're Joan Rivers or somebody like that and start cracking jokes like that. Um, uh, but it didn't seem to bother them. Groucho, uh, you know, Margaret Dumont was not Jewish, and he uh, he would go over to her house for Christmas, and and uh, it was said of him he would he f would favor any holiday to which food was attached. And <laughs> but I think that uh, it was only those moments in which they were forced to think about it. They uh, but they they did. Uh, you didn't want to play it too Jewish in the 20s for the reasons that you just said. It was a horrible, horrible era for Jews. And that's, that's true in the United States, too. I, one of the things I always reminded students is that anti-Semitism was not invented by Adolf Hitler. You know, been gone, you know as, as we've mentioned earlier, um, many came here because of the pogroms in Russia. Um, so uh, you basically dealt with it by not dealing with it. Now there's one. I I think I counted exactly two Yiddish terms in Marx Brothers films, right? Uh, there's Schnorr and uh, I forgot what the other one is off the top of my head. But um, those could have been those could have been and probably were at one point vaudeville jokes. So you just migrate them over. Uh, so they just didn't dwell on it. You tried to you tried to hit the targets that people felt were relevant in their, their era, like the, the Florida land swindles on the eve of the of the depression, or like college professors were always, were always safe targets, or opera, right? What if you really want to make a point about uh snootiness, opera's a good target. You know, it was Mark Twain said about opera, of all the forms of music, opera is the most expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, anyhow, yeah. So, did I answer your question? Or, um, no, no, you you absolutely did. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's wonderful, and and it's interesting to me. Yeah, you do a good job in the book of talking about. You mentioned, I think you you said it probably well here. This idea of not always having to deal with it, but there you do include in the book. I believe it's an exchange between um, Chico and his daughter where they're trying to go to a hotel and he just flat out tells the daughter in one, one line, basically, we're not going to stay here. They don't like Jewish people and that's it. And it's just very matter of fact. Yeah, I think he adds, we don't need these people. And yeah. And, and uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, and, uh, or you'd make a joke about it. Like, there's a very famous story, which might be apocryphal. Um, but if they, as they say, if this isn't true, it should be where Groucho, uh, took his young daughter Melinda to a, a, a swimming pool, and they said, uh, "They said, uh, Mr., you know, he said, uh, Mr. Marks, you can't go in because this this uh, club is restricted." He said, "Well, can my daughter go in halfway? She's only half Jewish." <laughs> and uh, you know, so they would make jokes about it. Uh, they joked about everything. I, you know, they were they were buried with Jewish. Uh, ceremonies and all that, so they were they didn't run away from it, but they just let's say let's put it this way: there was no profit in 
dwelling on it. He mm-hmm. wanted to uh, direct people's attention another way. And just to, to add to this too, um, in case people might be thinking, yeah, but it's not funny. Well, at the same time though, when Charlie Chaplin makes the dictator a little bit later on, one somebody asked him, I think it was somebody in the media asked him, why did you make this film? You know, it's not funny and this and that. And he has a line that I'll never forget. He said, because evil must be mocked. And I, and every time I think about that line, I think about, there's a lot of courage in saying that. And if you don't want to take it in the way that Chaplin means it, then I could see where you, you might think, well, that's not true. But no, actually, it takes quite a bit of courage to make a joke in a- that time and say, I refuse to give you the seriousness that you think you deserve. And so to me, when I read those jokes in, in your book, I immediately was brought to Chaplin and saying, I'm not giving you the satisfaction to take the stupidity that you're saying here seriously. So something else that I learned. So after, here's the coconuts. They get through it. They make the film. It. My understanding, and you can tell me if I'm wrong in this, my understanding is it. it actually did pretty well in terms of it went over well. So you would think that, okay, so here comes the meteoric rise. However, I didn't, something I didn't know until I read it in your book, if not for the crash in the 20s, we might not have ever actually had another Marx Brothers film after the coconuts. And so just how close were the Marx Brothers to never doing a second film? And and what were the circumstances surrounding their decision to, to make Animal Crackers in 1930? Well, again, Animal Crackers had already been a stage show. So, uh, and I should say at this point that these first two Marx Brothers movies were made in New York, not in Hollywood. Uh, So it was possible for them to actually go do their stage show and then make the movie, you know, because, you know, all they had to do was cross the Hudson to do that. Uh, So uh, that had something to do with it. But... Yeah, again, it's hard to know exactly. Groucho threatened to quit the movie so many times that sometimes you you start to think he's like the little boy cried wolf, right? <laughs> Is he really serious? It might actually be safer to say that he was a little bit lazy. <laughs> yeah, he didn't like to go through the, the hassle of, of movies because, you know, you have a play written for you a stage show written for you, you give some input into it. You say, yeah, that joke is terrible or so forth and so on. But once you have the script, you just do it. Well, there's no such thing as just a script in movies. You know, it undergoes multiple. A lot of the Marx Brothers movies took longer in the script process than they took to film, right? Uh, They took months and months to hash out uh, a script and, and, uh, Groucho tended to hate most of them. Uh, the ones he hated the most were the ones that did the best. <laughs> uh, but um, I think he didn't like the process. Vaudeville was uh, something they knew. Being on the stage, Broadway, that was kind of the goal they always had. And so now they're on Broadway. They make two shows on Broadway. And there's people saying, you got to stop that Broadway stuff. you got to get out to Hollywood and make movies. And of course, there's some reluctance to do that. Uh, but yeah, with 1929, that changes everything. Because Groucho, uh, as a lot of people who grew up poor, was very parsimonious. But he, inv- he invested heavily in the stock market. He lost almost everything he had. In 1929, uh, Harpo had to get a $10,000 loan from a from a, a benefactor. Chico never had any money. He gambled all his money away, so it didn't bother him too much. But uh, the movie saved them. And you're right, absolutely right. If, if uh, I mean, they probably at some point, somebody would have been savvy enough to say to them, you know, this whole Broadway musical thing is, is kind of... Um, reaching its saturation point and maybe they would have gone back to movies or uh, whatever. I mean, this it's always easy to speculate. We can't know for sure uh, 
what they would have done, but it's certainly the, the, the case is that movies made them very, very rich men. You know, something else I didn't think about until I read it in, in your book and then I made this connection. So millions of people today, they love the character Jim from The Office, and they love that character because he breaks the fourth wall, looks at the camera funny, makes a comment, and this and that. But really, Groucho was doing that way back when, breaking the fourth wall. And he did so, and this is the part that I had never thought of before, there's a lot of strategy behind this, actually, much more strategy than I had thought of. This idea of how can we use popular culture at the time to bring the audience into the film further and make them, um, in some sense, even more attached to the film and to the characters and to what's going on. So how did Groucho use soliloquies and breaking the fourth wall as a truly unique way of conveying his understanding of what was in the culture at the time. Yeah, well, first of all, again, I got to go back to the fact that they, they had been involved in the stage shows where timing is everything. So with Groucho, and also hitting your marks, which they didn't always do very well on, on a movie set. But when it came to be, having a wisecrack, Groucho knew where to be, how to express himself, and he had a pretty good sense of when. And so one of the things that he did with the, the fourth wall thing is he broke the narrative so that you could kind of catch up or breathe or whatever. It's a, I, I won't say it's a commercial of, of his day, but um, he just, they all had that timing down and they knew when to do it. And um, Again, those those aside, so which is what they are. I mean, we don't think of, of uh, people who write Broadway plays as being popular culture, but they were back those days. We don't think of some obscure piece of music uh, from an opera as being popular culture, but it was <laughs> right. Uh, so, popular culture is is an, an infinitely malleable thing. And I think Groucho used those those little uh, speeches of his to a riff off of what's going on in popular culture and b give the audience a little breathing space because uh, again a lot of their movies uh, not only is, is Groucho's speech fast but they're running <laughs> they're running around the, the stage there's a kind of frenetic energy to their films that. Uh, can be a little bit exhausting, you know. Th they did the same thing, by the way, with their with their uh, music or musical interludes, uh, the the piano solo, the harp solo, uh, which as I you know, you watch them, all the films, and after a while, you know, I, I start honestly fast forward to that because I've, I've seen it before and, and and all that. Although I do always enjoy Chico's shooting the keys thing that he does. That's that's <laughs> amazing stunt. But, um, you know, this, it, it serves the same purpose. It's a, a kind of a musical soliloquy or a musical uh, breaking of the fourth wall because a lot of times they're just plopped in there. They have nothing really to do with, with the script uh, other than people expected them to do it. It was part of their shtick. Yeah, I didn't know, again, until, until your book, that they actually didn't really want them in the films, right? The musical interludes. And yet, <clears throat> I can't imagine a film without them. I mean, I, I, I love the music. The music is is wonderful. And yes, the performance of the music too is is quite beautiful to watch also. So I was quite surprised to see that how how much they actually would, would rather have those taken out. Yep. Well, they didn't put it in, they didn't have their solos in Duck Soup. Uh, and they didn't have them in room service because that wasn't their that wasn't a script written for them. But uh, yeah, I, I think the other thing that happens to all comics, and they found themselves subject to this as well, is that once you become identified with a particular type of shtick, it's hard to get away from it. And Grouch also wanted to lose his grease paint mustache. That would have been a silly mistake on his part. Uh, but that was that was Groucho. That was his character. 
and uh, you know I, I mentioned also in the book that at one point Harpo is is uh, offered a lot of money to say one word, a chew, on in, in a movie, and he thought about it. Then he thought, oh, I spent so much time developing this character. Why would I throw it away? Now this is after, of course, he's given radio interviews and so forth and so on. And people knew that he wasn't really mute. That was a question. That was a big question when they first started making movies. Can he talk at all? And of course, they they invented a, a shaggy dog story tale to go with that. But um, yeah, you you can't you can't escape it. You know, like George Carlin talked at one point about, you know, he had to he had to play the the stone character. He said, even when I wasn't stoned. <laughs> uh, and you find yourself uh, thinking, oh, can't I do something? Groucho always wanted to make legitimate theater as well. He wanted to be a serious dramatic actor. That that would have been another mistake. It's just totally not suited for it. Uh, but you know, I, I think you do various things in you in your career, and then they become you, and then you have to you have to work out your relationship to those things. Uh, Groucho uh, Groucho did it largely by complaining. Harpo was just even he was easygoing, uh, and he would he would make his peace with it. And Chico said, "This is a paycheck. I need the money." <laughs> That's basically what it boiled down to. Yeah, I can't certainly can't hold that against Chico, to be honest with you, especially in, in the that time period. If someone's offering you money and even a little bit after, of course, you for um if speaking with anyone who went through the the Great Depression, I mean they'll it it stayed with them. That idea of if you could get a paycheck, you take that paycheck. Absolutely. I, I'd like to stay with Harpo for a minute if I can, because he's because he's such an interesting figure. You quote film historian. Richard Schickel referring to Harpo Marx as being the last great silent comedian. And that's actually quite a wonderful honor, really. Can you talk a little bit about the origin of Harpo's silence and how it helped connect the Marx brothers with both their past and their present as well? Yeah, well, that's that's an old thing too. It probably comes out of the, the Italian Commedia dell'arte, uh, where they tended to have a silent uh, character. Uh, Mimes have been around forever. Uh, vaudeville always had people who would mime and so forth. Uh, he wasn't, Harpa wasn't a great singer, apparently, according to most, um, most sources. So given what they started to do earlier in their career, which is they started off, you know, in vaudeville, in which they would sing, uh, you had to figure out something else to do. And he was very, very good with physical comedy. You know, you watch Harpo move on the screen and you don't even have to think that what he's doing is funny. You can just see the grace with which he's moving. Uh, they were all, by the way, pretty good. Uh, Groucho was much better at physical comedy than people give him credit for being. Um, but I think I think it probably just evolved out of that. You know, they're, they're, the act that they did in vaudeville uh, evolved several times. They, they would be in various partnerships and they would have to change the act. And Minnie herself got involved at some point. And so there was more music at that point. And if Harpo didn't have a strong enough voice, that would be a problem. Apparently Gummo wasn't a very good singer either. Um, so... I think it, I would say the answer to your question is it evolved organically, uh, and you you find your little niche at what you're good at, and then boy did he! After he found it, my goodness, he was spectacular. I mean, you watch the mirror sequence <laughs> and and uh, um, duck soup, and you, and you oh <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely. So we, we brought this up a little bit earlier, but let's I'd, I'd like to dive into it a little more specifically here. W when you talk about the roles that women play in the Marx Brothers, I think you do a, a, a great job of balancing out the fact that we're dealing with a different time period, and that's important. 
what was funny in one historical period might not be funny today. And by the way, what's funny to us today likely won't be as funny 50 to 100 years from now as well. Take right? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. I think I want to ask you about two of probably the more prominent women in the Marx Brothers Entertainment Universe. And that, of course, is Margaret Dumont and Thelma Todd. They each had their own kind of magical chemistry with the brothers. Did writing this book give you a new perspective or change your perspective on these women and the importance that they have on comedy and with the Marx Brothers? Yeah, Margaret Dumont um, was such a fantastic straight person. You know, straight, we used to say straight man, but she, obviously she's female. Uh, she is, you know, her, her, she started off in those movies as being kind of uh, clunky. You know, she was one of the ones who overly emoted and, and uh, Grouch always said she didn't get the jokes. And you can maybe see a little bit of that in the early movies, but after a while, you just see her kind of, you know, and you know that she gets the jokes. And, and you know that she knows what her role is, is to take the joke. Uh, she, it, it, she complained a little bit later that everybody, uh, that being in Marx Brothers movies, stereotype her. She'd probably write about that, you know, that, that she wasn't taken as seriously as she should have been. Um, Thelma Todd held her own. I mean, you know, you don't mess with Thelma Todd. <laughs> yeah, it, she's she's the, the opposite. You know, Groucho plays off of her rather than than Margaret Dumont. But you know, the victor in that scenario is she. <laughs> uh, Groucho is always the kind of the chump in that in that relationship. Um, and you know, he's awkward. You know, he's purposely awkward around around uh, Margaret Dumont. You know, when he tries to put the moves on Margaret Dumont to get to her money, and <laughs> with Thelma Todd, the money isn't what he's after. <laughs> if you catch my drift there, uh, but he ain't going to get there. <laughs> it's just not happening. And uh, so they're two very, very different type of people given what they can do. And that's the important codicil, that there are expectations of women at this time period. There is a pervasive view that men are superior to women. And you have to, you have to accept that. In, in fact, if you start to accept that, then you come, then as a student, you, uh, or as a writer, you have really, really rich material to explore gender relations and to talk about the evolution of gender relations. But yeah, Margaret Dumont was, you know, I, I really did appreciate her even more. Um, you know, she was, she was a bit more than just a foil. Uh, and if she's not the foil, the joke doesn't work. They have to have her. That's why they they often called her the fifth Marx brother, right? Um, yeah, they needed her, the sixth Marx brother. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I I love Dumont quite honestly, and she reminds me of of B. Arthur in the sense that both of them, how they could own a room with with that comedic look of displeasure. When they throw that out, they don't have to say a single word. Just put the, that look out there, and they could own an entire scene. And that's the part that, as I've gotten older, obviously when you're younger, the Marx Brothers, yeah, the jokes hit you differently when you're younger than when you, you get older. And as I've gotten older and watched these films with her, I can appreciate her role a lot more and appreciate her talent a lot more in being able to 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 show that displeasure of of the joke and it's funny that you mentioned too there was some there were conversations about whether or not she got the jokes but i always thought that that was part of the character absolutely absolutely yeah. the other thing she did she did was physical right she would you look at her on the screen you think she's a really tall woman she wasn't 
she was, I think, five nine, I believe. And but she always wore high heels and she always dressed in these matronly costumes and she would put herself forward. And then she would often have a, an elaborate hat of some sort. So when she came on the screen, she dominated the screen, right? Which is why it's funny when Groucho cuts her down, you know, because she's playing this patrician character and she's physically patrician as well. Now, that's a, a bit of a, of magic, really, on her part. It's, it takes some talent to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I um, <clears throat> so I couldn't I couldn't possibly do this conversation without spending a little bit of time on on horse feathers, just because I I just oh, <laughs> but again, you in some sense through through your hard work, you you really taught me quite a bit about this film in 1932. And again, this idea that it wasn't an enjoyable process for the Marx Brothers to make horse feathers in 1932. And yet they're on the screen, of course, they don't show it too much, at least to the average viewer, you can't see. It looks like they're having an absolute blast. Mm -hmm. So what were the circumstances surrounding the making of horse feathers that made it such an unpleasant experience for them? Well, first of all, Chico broke ribs <laughs> that, you know, so he's playing, he's doing the football sequences with that. Uh, number two, they're, they're thinking about, about whether or not they even want to make these, these films anymore. Number three, the script process was a bear. Uh, and they're really just kind of, I, I think it was unpleasant for them also because they still really are not sure what it means to be in movies. You know, one of their directors actually yelled at him and said, this is a movie. You know, we don't do this uh, in it, it, it movies. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's uh, the death of uh, of Sam. Uh, no, the death of Minnie, rather. Um, um, you know, it's a lot going on. And, and uh, Chico being broke again because his gambling problems. Um relationships falling apart uh you know Groucho's marriage should have ended probably seven or eight years before it actually did uh all these kinds of things are going on uh there's um yeah did you have another thing in mind you wanted me to talk about with this or, or? yeah I I think also a couple of things that you uncovered here too uh, that I wasn't aware of one was that at the time, of course, there actually are very real discussions happening a around football coming from, of all people, Teddy Roosevelt as well. And this is, you know, one of the most hyper-masculine uh, American presidents you certainly you're going to find. And here he is, he's sort of saying, we need to clean this up or we're going to just get rid of it. And and so when you when you talk about the the physical part of even just shooting a film about football, it makes a lot of sense to me that that it would be quite a difficult task. I mean, they're if you watch the movie, they're they're running into each other plenty fast enough, and and so um, that it made sense watching the film again after reading your book, seeing uh, Chico as the QB and sort of slow moving a little bit as well. It made a lot more sense when I learned that he was actually quite hurt during that. So all of that put together, you can kind of tell that it, it, it is, it would be kind of a very difficult experience. I, I, I want to draw your attention to one of the most famous scenes in that film, though, and that is, of course, uh, Groucho and Chico doing the swordfish scene with the password. And I'd like to bring you in a little bit, again, similarly, probably to the, the Catholic discussion a little bit here. So here you have this speakeasy scene, right? Are the Marx Brothers trying to make a statement here by including a speakeasy, or are they just reflecting a reality at the time? Oh, I'd say yes to both of those questions. Uh, it was very, very clear by 32 that prohibition was a failure. Uh, a lot of police de departments around the country just stopped even trying to uh, break up 
illegal bars and so forth. And then, of course, the Roosevelt Roosevelt runs in thirty two, promising that he'll get rid of he'll repeal prohibition. So uh, thirty two, it's it's the beginning of the end. Uh, well, no, it's the, it's almost the end of the end, I should say, uh, more accurately. Um, so yeah, absolutely, and of course. It, the, the speakeasy scene works because it is so familiar. Everybody knew that there were, <laughs> that there were places where booze was sold illegally. A lot of people made a lot of money on it. it organized crime in America <laughs> did very well. Thank you very much. Thanks to prohibition. So it's, uh, you know, the whole idea of trying to get into a speakeasy it was something that would have been familiar. They, they, uh, they were certainly not the first to make jokes about it. The stand-up comics were doing that. Um, but, yeah, they're certainly reflecting the culture, and they're certainly lampooning it. Uh, it the funny thing is that Groucho didn't even drink at that point. He, he didn't drink until much later in life. Uh, so he didn't have, as they say, a, a dog in the hunt, uh, but you know, that stuff that they did with the, with, with the, uh, trying to get into the speakeasy with the password, the swordfish and all that, it's, it's hysterical and it's hysterical because it lampoons that which was already lampooned and they took it a step further. <laughs> you thought maybe there was nothing else to say about what a joke prohibition was by that period of time, and you were wrong, right? Uh, they 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 put another spin on it. Uh, so, yeah, both both of those things are going on. They they definitely are making fun of prohibition, and they're and they are definitely understanding that their audience wants to laugh at it as well. So I have just one kind of final question for you here. One of your goals in, in the book is also to kind of think about what is comedy. So after writing something like this, this extensive work, and revisiting, you know, the Marx Brothers and having taught classes and all of that, what did writing this book teach you about comedy? Uh, if anything, that it was much broader than I had even imagined. Uh you know, I was kind of familiar with a lot of terms, but I started musing on the spectrum. And we kind of have a spectrum, if if you will, if you like safer comedy, that safer comedy is wit. Somebody just comment thrown out and you and you riff off of it or you make a, a pun or something like that. That's safe comedy. Uh, if, if you want to go to the other end, then mockery is the aggressive form. And then just about everything that you can imagine lies somewhere in between those two poles of the spectrum. They all, in my opinion, can be absolutely uproariously funny. I mean, gee whiz, I, you know, I, I invoked Jan Joan Rivers earlier. Mockery was her thing. And a more aggressive comic you would be hard to find. She was hysterical. Right. And and uh, she would she would do all those kinds of things. Uh, I, the Marx Brothers seldom engaged in outright mockery. The chaplain and the great dictator, that's mockery. Right. Uh, they, they were kind of somewhere more towards the, uh, the middle of the spectrum, I would say. Uh, although, you know, some thing, things that they they did. Uh, put in the films, people, some people might be upset with some of the depictions of race. I have some arguments against that in the, uh, in the book. Um, but um, that's what it really taught me. It was a very, very broad spectrum. And so there's a lot that people say, I don't like comedy because it's too mean. I say, find, find some comedy in your life because you need it <laughs> to get through life. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very broad thing and a very old thing. I mean, we do. We don't. You know, you would think something as as old as comedy. The other thing it taught me is, you would think we would have figured it out by now. We're still not exactly certain why we laugh. Uh, we're still not exactly certain what social role it plays. Uh, well, roles, I should say, uh, plural. Uh, we still debate those kinds of things because it's so bloody complex, you know, <laughs> uh, and broad. Uh, that, that whole spectrum of it. So I think that's what I learned uh, by writing 
writing the book and uh, thinking about it. Yeah. I love the idea of find your comedy, what you just said there. I think that's absolutely necessary, especially today, but likely in, in any era of, of human existence, you need to have some sense of, of comedy, some sense of humor uh, as, a, as a mechanism for dealing with um, all the terrible things that can come with life. We need humor to be there. So I, I think that's a absolutely perfect way to think about it. Rob, thank you so much for coming on, on the show. I love the book and sharing this with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Joe, I want to hear before you go, what's your comedy? <laughs> oh, I love chaos humor. Okay. I love chaos. Anything, you know, uh, a room full of people and somebody randomly doing the robot in the middle of the room to me is absolutely hysterical. <laughs> Anything that is a complete disruption of the norm. Uh, and I, to me, chaos humor is just, yeah, that, that'll get me every time. And I admit too, that, that it doesn't often get everyone Sometimes I'll be the only person laughing in that room <laughs> saying, <laughs> what is that person doing back there? I just love it. I love chaos humor. How about you? Do you know, do you have yours? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm a horrible punster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Much people have threatened me. They say, you know, if you weren't so, such a small guy, I think I'd beat you up for that one. But I have a, a good friend who is also a punster and our, our goal in life is someday to make a pun that's so bad that people are physically ill from hearing it. So we have not achieved that yet. <laughs> that sounds like the perfect plot for, for a terrible movie that I want to see. <laughs> I want to watch that movie. The, the search super villains who are so bad that they're they're trying to destroy the earth by finding the worst pun. That's a movie I want to see, quite honestly. <laughs> All right. Well, well that's a great way yeah, to end on laughter is absolutely perfect, I think. Well, thank you again for having me, Joe. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it as well. The Marx Brothers aren't for everyone, which is why we've asked everyone to leave the room and let the rest of us talk. That's a kind of Marx Brothers joke. What do you think? Today, we have so many serious shows and podcasts and films, but we don't have much in the way of thoughtful silliness. That might sound like a ridiculous phrase, thoughtful silliness, but I'm sticking to it. In fact, until I find my adhesive dissolver, I'm sticking to everything. Okay, they can't all be great jokes. Matter of fact, none of them are probably great, but that's neither here nor there. You need to feed yourself comedy. We need some silliness in our lives. We need to be reminded that it's okay to laugh, to smile. And especially this message needs to be filtered down to our young kids. It's okay to have fun. It might just be the best medicine that we have against the growing feelings of depression and anxiety and an overall loss of meaning that seems so pervading today. So, get out there and find your silly. And when you find your silly, put a tracker on it in case you lose it again. Until next time. Try to keep one foot firmly planted on neutral ground and have a great day.